Hello. Well, I'm hoping this is working okay. Um, hello, End Time Church. My name is Joshua. I'm the pastor of Therfield Chapel here in England between uh, Cambridge and London, a little outside a little town called Royston. And as far as I understand, this is, this is the first time I'm doing this. I'm speaking to you guys there at End Time Church. The majority of you, I think, are American, though, as you're internet-based, you may have people there from, uh, who, who participate from all over the world. I want to thank uh, particularly uh, Pastor Christopher and Jake and um, these guys for having me along this evening and allowing me to share from the Word of God. So I've been asked to bring something from the Scriptures, and so I hope you're hungry or you're interested in hearing something from the Bible. Uh, most of you probably uh, don't know who I am particularly, unless uh, Pastor Christopher or someone has kind of um, told you about me. Uh, for those who do know me, you may know me from my blog, either Sanity's Cove or, uh, or possibly the book I wrote uh, a year or so ago called Elijah Men, uh, Elijah Men Eat Meat. It's a book for, for everyone, but particularly for, uh, for young men. Um, and so, so a lot of times when I get to visit another church and uh, speak or, or teach as a guest, uh, people anticipate that I'm going to speak on Elijah. Well, uh, I hope you won't be disappointed if tonight, or I don't know if it's night where you guys are at, it's night right here where I'm recording. Um, it's, uh, it's night here and uh, I'm not going to be talking about Elijah, so I, I hope that doesn't disappoint. But I am going to be talking about another guy in the Bible and he, he's a little lesser known. Um, he's lesser known, his life story at least is lesser known, whereas many people are familiar with the story of Elijah and the, the big battle that happened on Mount Carmel between him and um, uh, him and the prophets of Baal and, and the big showdown they had, and, um, whereas that's very familiar. The life of Judah, Judah is, is not so well known. He often gets uh, overshadowed by his younger brother Joseph. And so I'm going, to turn, I'm going to be in the book of Genesis here, Genesis chapter 38. And we're going to look at his life because his life really is phenomenal. Uh, there's a lot of books out there. You can go on Amazon and find a lot of books on Joseph. You can't find a lot of books on Judah. It's just funny because this is where the Jewish people get their name from. Uh, to be a Jew is to be someone of the tribe of Judah. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, and he is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. It, it, Judah as a tribe plays a very important role in the Old Testament. Uh, King David, of course, comes from Judah politically. Very, very important uh, among the people of Israel. And, um, and yet not many of that people are familiar with the founder of this tribe's story. So um, I can't go to his whole life there. Genesis, um, it kind of touches on his life here and there in different places in Genesis, similar to the way it does with Joseph. It's kind of interwoven with the whole Joseph narrative in the second part or really toward the last one-third, really, of the book of Genesis. Um, but I want to read about his redemption, because he didn't start out as a good guy. For those of you who are familiar with the story of Joseph, you know that Judah played a big role in the attacking, and the kidnapping, and the selling in, uh, into slavery of his younger brother Joseph. So he started off as a bad guy, as a human trafficker. Uh, that's how he starts out with, but he ends very differently. So what turned him around? Well, we're going to talk about that now in Genesis 38. So it says in Genesis 38, at that time, Judah left his brothers and settled near an Adulamite named Hira. So this isn't too long after he sold his brother into slavery. He is set to be the, um, the guy who takes over the family. Uh, he's not the oldest, but his older brothers, Reuben, Levi, Simeon, these guys, they, they had sort of forfeited their right to leadership through either um, uh, through offending their father or there's different reasons they've been passed over. But now it, it's, it's falling to Judah. Judah's the fourth son, but he is the guy that really is, is going to inherit everything. So it's going to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah. He's sort of next in line. So very important out of the twelve brothers. So, but this guy, he just sold his little brother into slavery. He's feeling, presumably, we have to read between the lines, the text doesn't say presumably, he's feeling bad, he's feeling guilty, he's feeling ashamed, and what does it do? Well, it says, it says he left his brothers. Um, and that, that's kind of what we do when we sin, don't we? We 
uh, <clears throat> we sin sexually, we sin uh, in anger and rage, we lose our, our cool and we run our mouth, or, or we do something and we just, we just want to be alone, we want to get away, we don't want to be hanging out with the people at church because it's embarrassing, and we know we're not the person we're pretending to be or supposed to be. And, well, this was Judah. He leaves his brothers, he leaves his family, he kind of sets out on his own, and he, he's hanging out with, uh, with the Canaanite. Uh, this was the time when God's people were sort of this isolated little family tribe in the midst of all these wicked, violent Canaanite people. And God had told them to be separate. <clears throat> don't don't inter intermingle with these guys. And But Judah left them. He's hanging out with his Canaanite friend. And it says in verse 2, There Judah saw the daughter of a Canaanite named Shua. He took her as a wife and slept with her. Um, I'm reading for the Holman, the AHCS B version, if any of you have it, but other translate the translators uh, don't translate it quite as politely. They're a little more true to the Hebrew in, <clears throat> when it says um, he saw her, he married her, he had sex with her. That was Judah's life. He saw a good-looking girl, wanted to sleep with her, so he married her. Um, and that that is so different from what we saw earlier with his father and his grandfather with how they found their wives. I mean, there was prayer involved. Abraham was certain, don't get a, a Canaanite woman as a wife for my son. You know, there was great care that the future leader of the tribe of God's people would have a really godly wife who would be a godly mother to uh, the children to raise them up and, uh, and not be wicked, not be violent, not be crude, uh, to, be, to be a good, uh, a godly woman. Um, and whereas Judah, even though he's going to take on leadership of the tribe and his children are going to end up then being the ones who lead God's people further, he doesn't give any care to them having, um, to him marrying a woman who will be a godly mother to his children and, and leader of the future people of God. So it says he marries her and he sleeps with her. She conceived and gave birth to a son and named him Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. Onan's a funny guy. We're about to talk to you about him in a minute. And she gave birth to another son and named him Shelah. It was at Chesbiz that she gave birth to him. So he has three sons. The oldest is Ur. So we're going to have the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and Ur. That's going to be how the the great dynasty of God's people is currently set up to run. Um, but, well, God intervenes in this, in this whole picture. It says then in verse 6, Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn son, and her name was Tamar. So we don't know the name of Judah's wife, just that he married a Canaanite girl. But then he goes and he finds a wife for his son Ur. Does he pray about it? Does he seek a godly direction? No, he just finds another Canaanite gal. This time, we know her name, and her name is Tamar. And Ur, so Ur and Tamar, they're going to be the future royal couple of Israel. They're going to be the king and queen, so to speak. They're going to be the patriarch and the matriarch over the whole tribe. Um, but it says in verse 7, Now Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord put him to death. Yes, Jesus killed Ur because he was a bad, bad boy. Jesus, yes, he retains the prerogative as the royal son of God to kill people uh, if and when he so chooses. Now, mercifully, he doesn't do it a lot. And God knows I've probably done more than enough for Jesus to kill me several times over. Um, he is merciful. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in compassion and grace. And yet, if he treated us as our sins deserve, he would kill all of us uh, very quickly. He said to Adam and Eve, the day you eat of that fruit of the tree, you will surely die. And yet, they didn't die. I mean, they died spiritually, but he, he granted mercy. And um, But in this case, the punishment is swift. And God can do that. God can bring swift punishment and swift justice. And we don't always know when he's going to do that. That's why sin is so important yeah, you know, to deal with quickly. Because we don't know. God gives, shows us mercy and he gives us time to repent. But we don't know how much time that's going to be. Sometimes God can move swiftly. And he moves, we don't, we don't know how Ur presumably was an older teenager at this time. Maybe early 20s. Um, and, uh, and maybe he had been wicked his whole life. But it says he's wicked and God kills him. Put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Sleep with your brother's wife. 
Perform your duty as their brother-in-law and produce offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he released his semen on the ground so that he would not produce offspring for his brother. What he did was evil in the Lord's sight, so he put him to death also. Lovely, lovely, lovely passage, piece of scripture there. I I thoroughly commend that all of you should uh, commit that piece to memory. So the father, Judah, says to the brother, Ur's brother, Onan, go sleep with your sister-in-law, have sex with her, make a baby. He sleeps with her, but before he, you know, climaxes, he withdraws and spills the semen on the ground. Why is this in the Bible? I'll tell you why it's in the Bible. Now, some of you probably, th- maybe depending on what church you were at, if you came from some very conservative fundamentalist church, you were probably told that this is a passage about masturbation. You were probably taken away uh, to some sort of camp when you were a 13-year-old boy and told, if you masturbate, Jesus is going to kill you. Um, well, actually, it has nothing to do with masturbation. Um, this, this pass- if this is masturbation, this is just about the strangest form of masturbation that... Uh, that I've ever come across. It's not about masturbation, but Jesus is angry at him, but it's not because he masturbated. It's because it's, it's, it's because he's entirely selfish and he hates his brother. This, this needs a little explanation. Back then, there was no social security. There was no welfare. If you were a widow, if you were left childless, if you were left a widow, if your husband died, you're just in trouble. And so... In, th- in this part of the world at this time, what would happen is if, if uh, your brother, if you were a man and your brother married and uh, he marries this gal and then your brother dies before they can have any children, his name is erased uh, from the face of this earth. Like he has no children to take on and carry on his name, which in, in that part of the world was seen as a, as a great dishonor to the brother. It's as if he never existed. And so what the brother would do is then he would sleep with his sister-in-law, widow sister-in-law, so that she would get pregnant, and those children to be born would have not the name of the biological father or the uncle father, but of the, of the dead brother. And so the dead brother's name would be carried on and as a way of seeing us honoring your brother. But here's the catch. There's an inheritance catch to this because this means that who, who is going to, who's going to take over rulership of the family? Remember, Ur was, Ur was the firstborn. But he didn't have any kids. So if he died without kids, who's going to take control of the family business? Remember, there's a lot of money. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were small, but they, they were rich. They had money. Now Onan is set. Now it's going to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and Onan. Ur's out of the picture. Now Onan. He's set to be royalty. He's set to, if you were thinking royalty, he'd be set to, uh, to wear the crown, so to speak. But if he has a kid through Tamar, it actually legally won't even be his kid. It'll be his brother's kid, and he won't get the crown. His brother's kid, which is technically his kid, but not legally, will get the crown. So this is about power. This is about politics. This is about money. It, it's not about sex. It's not about masturbation. So it's a real wicked thing what he's doing. He's withdraw- He's having sex with Tamar, but he's withdrawing from her and spilling his semen on the ground just because he wants to be the one with the power and the money. He wants to inherit it and not, you know, this kid who's not even technically his kid. Uh, so Jesus kills him. G- yeah, just back to Jesus. You know, thug Jesus. He's, he's taking Pete one, one right after another. So verse 11, Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Sheila grows up. For he thought he might die too, like his brother. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. So, you know, the father, Judah, he's freaking out. He thinks, you know, this girl is a black widow. Whoever she marries, son dies. And so he has three sons. doesn't want her to marry the third son. So he says, go back to your dad's house. And when my boy grows up, you know, I mean, he's only, what? I don't know, 13, 14 years old. It's like, you know, let him grow up and finish going through puberty or whatever, you know, then he can have sex with you and you can have a kid. And remember, Tamar, th- this is business for Tamar, you know. If she has a kid, she has a son, he's going to inherit everything and then she's going to be like, you know, the queen mother. I mean, you know, it's her kid is going to be the one to take over all this. I don't, don't think she's not economically, you know, it's easy to think of her just as the victim. Well, well, that's partially true, but 
she has some motive for really wanting to have this kid. There's money in it for her if you know she plays her cards right in this. <clears throat> After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. And when Judah had finished mourning, he sent his friend here, the Adulamite, up to Timnah, to the sheep shears. Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow's clothes, veiled her face, and covered herself, and sat at the entrance to Enam, which is on the way to Timnah. For she saw that though Sheila had grown up, she had not been given to him as a wife. And when Judah saw her, he thought to her, she was a prostitute, for she had uh, covered her face. So he went over and said, Come, let me sleep with you. For he didn't know that she was his daughter-in-law. Okay, this too deserves a little explanation. So his wife dies, he grieves from her. Um, so even though she wasn't a godly woman, they must have had at least a semi-okay marriage, I guess, maybe. I mean, he wasn't happy that his wife died. He grieved over his wife's death. And yet after a little while of grieving, his friends come on and say, Hey, buddy, come on, we're going to Vegas. You know, it's like, right, time to cheer up. Uh, we're going to sheep shearing season. This is like Mardi Gras. This is like uh, all the farmers get together, shear their sheep, and then just party and get drunk and hire up prostitutes in the evening. This is what they do. So he says, come on, up to sheep shearing season. Tamar, he hears that, you know, she had probably heard his wife died, and yada, yada, yada. Tamar has grown up. He's now 16, 17, whatever. He's old enough to have sex. And her thinking, she, she's, he's still not getting to have sex with uh, Sheila, the son. And... Um, so she gets this plan. So, you know, she, she remember, this, this is like people do a lot of crazy stuff when millions and millions of dollars are at stake. You know, this is your future right here. So she dresses up as a hooker. She goes up and, you know, she puts on her clubbing clothes. Back then, this was, she was um, dressed up like a shrine prostitute, so she wore a veil, which means she was more a top dollar call girl. She wasn't like your average, you know, run-of-the-mill um, hooker, like she was, you know, she dressed like a, a type of girl that would, you know, only perform for a whole lot of money um, with the way she was dressed. So, um, so he says, okay, I want to have sex with you. And she says, what will you give me for sleeping with me? I'll send you a goat uh, from my flock, he replied, which in that day would have been a good amount of money uh, for sexual favors. Like she was asking for a lot, so she must have been dressed as a a pretty provocative, pretty attractive um, hooker for her, him to send an entire goat. Uh, I'll send a goat from my flock, he replied. But she thought, only if you leave something with me until you send it. What should I give you, he asked. And she answered, your signet ring, your cord, and the staff in your hand. So she gave them to her and slept with her, and she got pregnant by him. She got up and left, and then removed her veil and put on the widow's clothes back on. And when Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, in order to get back the items, he had left with the woman, he could not find her. He had asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute who is beside the road at Enam? There has been no cult prostitute here, they answered. So the Dolomite returned to Judah and said, I couldn't find her, and furthermore, the men of the place said there's been no cult prostitute here. Judah replied, let her keep the items for herself, otherwise we'll become a laughing stock. After all, I did send this young goat, but you could not find her. All right, there's, um, the, the plot thickens a little bit. All right, so he sleeps with her. They have sex. She says, I want some sort of, I'm just not going to take your word for a thing. You're going to send me a whole goat. It's like, yeah, I'll sleep with you for, you know, $10,000. Uh, but first, let's have sex. Then I'll send you the $10,000 later. She's like, yeah, that, that's not how it's going to happen. Okay, so uh, I want your passport, your driver's license. I want some ID. I, w I want some sort of guarantee here. So he does it. He gives the signet ring, the staff, which was sort of the ancient form of ID. You know, you don't want to lose those. There's, those are pretty important documents, things to be carrying around. Um, and yet when he then goes and sends a friend with the goat, uh, she's gone and he's lost his signet ring and a staff and that's kind of, that's embarrassing. That's kind of a big deal. So they look around. Has anyone seen my driver's license? Uh, really? Who'd you leave it with? Um, uh, <coughs> hooker. <coughs> hooker. Yeah. And you know, so he's having to admit to everyone that uh, a hooker swiped him out of his signet ring and staff and that's just, you know, when you're a future patriarch set to lead a nation, that's, that's pretty embarrassing. Here in England, you know, every now and then something embarrassing about one of the royals will come out. They did something kind of naughty, and, and it, it's not like all over the newspapers. So this is kind of a big deal. Uh, he's really embarrassed, and he says, man, just let it pass. Just let me keep the goat. Now, if you had been following, if you'd read the previous chapter in Genesis, chapter 37, where Judah uh, and his brothers trick their father Jacob, concerning Joseph, 
when they kidnap him. Th there's a similarity here. I don't know if you catch that, you caught that. It, what happened after they sold um, Joseph, the little brother, into slavery? They said, right, what are we going to tell dad? Like, his favorite son is gone. And Judah said, I know. Let's take a goat. We'll take a goat and kill the goat. And, uh, and then take uh, Joseph's coat, the coat of many colors, the technicolor dream coat, whatever you, you have it. And we'll, we'll put the goat's blood on, on the coat. And then we'll send it. And then, so they did that. And then they sent it back to dad, uh, to, to Jacob, with the message, do you recognize these? Sure enough, you see, Judah had used a goat to trick his father, Jacob, into thinking that Joseph was, is dead. And now, who's left holding the goat? Yeah, it's Judah. J Judah, who had tricked his father with a goat, is now being tricked with a goat. And so the sins he committed over 20 years earlier is now coming back to haunt him. What you sow, you will reap. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar has been acting like a prostitute, which um, is um, a Hebrew way of saying she's been sleeping around. She, she's, she's not been faithfully waiting for your son. She, um, she, she's been acting like a prostitute, now she's pregnant. Bring her out, Judah said, and let her be burned to death. Wow, that's kind of hardcore. It's like, and Judah thinks, wow, the girl's pregnant. This is my, finally, I can get rid of Tamar. This crazy black widow girl is just waiting to inherit all of my stuff that I'm going to inherit when my dad dies. She's just waiting to inherit. And uh, I have a legal right to give my son to her, but I don't want to do that. And I know she, if she's been sleeping around. Well, then all bets are off. Let's punish her. Let's burn her. Remember, he's a pretty wicked guy. It's interesting, sometimes really wicked people get really morally upright and say, how dare you do that? That's probably our generation. Like, we do a lot of wicked stuff from, uh, you know, abortion to, uh, you know, we're gluttonous when it comes to food, we're you know, moral, we're greedy, we're, we're wicked people. And yet we have this strong moral compass at the same time to condemn people who have different types of sins than our own. So he says, bring her out, let her be burned to death. Um, hmm, morally inconsistent at the least. And she, as she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law with this message. I am pregnant by the man to whom these items belong. And she said, examine them. Whose signet ring cord and staff? Whose are these? And when he received his own signet ring and staff with the message whose are these do you recognize these it must have all come back oh the message he wrote to his father judah you recognize this whose coat is this and now it all comes back the man who had deceived his father has now been deceived and he comes face to face with his own sin only the Holy Spirit can orchestrate something like that. Up to this moment, Judah has been a very wicked, very selfish man. A uh, horrible man, a terrible man, violent, immoral. And, and if the Holy Spirit comes and sets up things in such a way that he is now perfectly reaping what he sowed. It says Judah recognized them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Sheila and he did not know her intimately again. So, he confesses his sin, and he says, I am not righteous, I am unrighteous. This girl that I'm about to burn to death, I'm actually worse than she is. And that's, that's the first word of repentance. That's the first word of salvation. Not that I am a good person, but I'm a terrible person. We are Christians not because we are good people, but because Jesus is a great savior. That, that's all. Um, I am not a great Christian, but I have a great Savior, and his name is Jesus, and my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. When it came time for her to give birth, there were twins in her womb, and as she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand, and the midwife took it and tied a scarlet thread around it, announcing, this one came out first, but he pulled his hand back, and his brother came out, and she said, you have broken out first, so he was named Perez. 
Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread tied to the hand, came out, and his name was Zara. And I'm not going to go in the story too much here, but that name Perez, that was born of Judah and his daughter-in-law Tamar. You may recognize that name Perez because it finds its way into the Christmas story. As we go into Christmas season, we're going to read Jesus' genealogy there. And what do we find in Matthew chapter 1? Perez. This crazy, incestuous, hillbilly family, uh, in all this sin and all this wickedness, Jesus reaches down and he redeems not only Judah, he redeems this whole family situation. And he chooses to be born right into this family, right into this mess, right into uh, the family where uh, people are lying and cheating and playing politics on each other. He steps down and he gets born right there. And this is the message we carry. This is our good news. This is the marriage message we carry to the world, that Jesus Christ can redeem any life, no matter how broken, no matter how guilty, no matter how dirty. Jesus Christ can clean up you and your family, and he, he doesn't just look for the perfect family to inhabit. He comes and inhabit those people who are humble, who confess that they are sinners and they are in need of salvation. Thank you again, uh, End Time Church, for letting me come and share the scriptures with you. And I just pray that um, the powerful redemption of Christ will be manifest in your presence as a congregation uh, during this Christmas season. Bye.